you know, because the Bible says we need to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We need to proclaim some victories. When God has done certain things within your life, we should let people know what God has done. You know, we always tell God and we always tell people during the good things. But during the broken times of our life, during those times when everything feels like it's fallen into place, can we still give God glory? And that's what I believe we have to do. We need to let the redeemed of the Lord say so and proclaim the truth and proclaim his word. Well, we are in the second week of uh, the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. And I'm sure that you have said this prayer like I have many times. But today we're going to take the second part of our Lord's Prayer and, and use a phrase. But if you would, say this prayer with me. With your eyes closed, what we learned about last week, with the holiness and the reverence of God, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who we have debt against. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're taking a phrase today. And that phrase is, give us this day our daily bread. And it's talking about the provision of God. The first section, the heaven, is the hallowed be thy name, which is talking about worship. These guys came up here today with Cassie, and, and they worshiped. They led us in worship. We are leading in worship as we sing, and as we teach, and as we pray. Worship is just the audience of one that our hearts are focused, and God is the object of our affection and our attention. That's worship. Heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done. It's just talking about the guidance that God wants to guide within our life, move within our life, teach us, mold us, and keep us. And then thy will be done is we have to yield to God's sovereignty. We are not in control. We are not in control in a lot of areas within our life. There's a lot of things that take place within our life that we are totally not in control of. But God said, thy will be done. What we need to do is say, God, what do you have in store for us? I want to be fulfilled. I want to follow. I want you to guide me in my life. And then it says, on earth, give us our bread. And that's our provision. Our provision is talking about today. Next week, we're going to talk about forgiveness, and that's talking about yesterday. And then we're going to talk about lead us not into temptation, but that's going to talk about the future. But today, what we need to do is put everything on the table. We need to look at our life and give to us our daily bread. What does all that mean? The first time you would look at that, you would think that's talking about our physical sustenance. You would think that's about what we're going to have for dinner today. We're going to think about what we're going to eat tonight, or we think about food. But this is so much more than the bread that we partake of. This is talking about everything within our life. Give to us our daily needs. And when we understand our daily needs, we understand that God cares about us daily. He cares about exactly everything that you go through what in the world are you having to do? What in this world is happening? We look at our physical needs. We can look at our shelter, our food, our clothing. Then we can look at some eternal needs, some emotional needs, some stability, confidence, or even self-esteem, our spiritual needs. We look at all these things that we can look and we can say, I struggle with so many things. I look at my life and I look at my problems and I just don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do. And he says, daily, put your needs, put everything that you struggle with, every desire that you have, every gift that God has given to you, put it on the table and let the daily bread of God sustain you. We're not talking about food. 
Because here in, in our society today, we don't really worry about what we're going to eat. Oh, this sermon could be preached in Cambodia, it could be preached in Russia, it could be preached in a lot of different countries, that they are worried about where their next meal is coming from, and they would talk about their food for their provision. But we don't need to worry about the food. We need to worry about what God wants in our everyday life. What is our provision? What is our need? The prayer for God's provision. Give us this day our daily bread. It doesn't say, give me this day my daily bread. It is not a personal prayer for you to say, Lord, give me. Sometimes we treat God as a little puppet in the Santa Claus. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we get upset when God doesn't deliver what we think we should have or what we deserve. And it says in a very humble state, if we take the first part of that phrase, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven, give to us our daily bread. As a need of the church, as a need of our life, we need to humbly go before God and investigate the very needs that we have. What is it that I struggle with? What is it that I desire? And the thing that you need and the thing that you struggle with and the thing that is going over in your head and in your life, it may be different than mine. But the greatest thing about God is He is all-knowing. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful God knows exactly what you need. And all he is asking for us to do is ask, give to us our daily bread, our need, our convenient need, whether it is emotional or whether it is stability, whether it's spiritual, whether it's relational, it's a daily need. It's all the way found back in the Old Testament when, when the Israelites were wandering in the wilderness and they were in need for food. God provided for them what's called manna. And it was a, a bread-like substance that they would go out and it would be found on the ground and, and they would go out and they could go out and they could get manna enough for that day. Except for the day before the Sabbath and they could pick up two days so they could have it on the Sabbath day. But the manna would rot and stink if they picked up more than one day's supply of food. And it's called the manna principle. And the manna principle is reliant on God every day. They knew, and God knew, that if they could have the opportunity to get everything that they had, they would pack everything up, and they would get everything that they needed. They would store it into the future, and then they would not need God for tomorrow because they had everything they needed today. And God sometimes still thinks that same way, that it's a daily need. I want my people that are called by my name to humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And he said what he would do is if we give him our abilities, our life, our need, our desires, our problems on a daily basis, he will give to us the very desires of our heart. He wants us to trust in him on a daily basis. The manna principle is so simple. It's today. It's what you're going through today. See, it's easy to live on yesterday. It's easy to live on yesterday's successes. It's easy to live on yesterday's faith. It's easy to live in fear because of yesterday's problems. It's easy to live in the fear of the failures of the sins of yesterday. It's easy to look back at the failures of our past and a lot allow us to live into the future because of the junk that we've had in the past. The fear. The fear. God says, today's a brand new day. When you wake up and you give to me and you trust in me in all of my life, give us our daily bread, our daily circumstances, our daily needs. Let God take care of it daily. I can look in the past and say, you know what? God has already forgiven that. I can look into the future and the fear of what I'm going to do or how I'm going to get there. I can say, that's all God's too. 
But what I can do is I can look up every morning, every day, and I can put everything that I have on the table of God and say, today I trust in you. Nothing else. I can trust in you. And if I can trust in you, you are going to provide for me. The all-sovereign God knows exactly what you need. He knows how to give it to you. And what he's saying is, I want you to humbly come before me. Just like the man of principle. Don't, don't stock up things that you will not need, God. Don't be so poor that you'll steal for God. In Proverbs chapter 30, there's a scripture there that I think is, is really neat. I want you to turn there. It's found in, in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 7, 8, and 9. Um, it's a great little story. It says, Oh God, I beg two favors from you. Let me have them before I die. First, help me never to tell a lie. Second, give me neither poverty nor riches. Because here's what he says. For if I grow rich, I may deny who you are, who is the Lord. And if I am too poor, I may steal that this must insult God's holy name. I don't want to be rich till I don't trust in you. But neither do I want to be poor that I can hurt your name. I just want you to provide for me, to give to me the very things that I need to have. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 31 and 34, it says this. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows what you need of all things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is in its own trouble. Deal with what you have today. Understand that God wants to take care of you today. Don't be stressed about tomorrow. Many of us have the problems of worry. How many of you guys worry? Stay up and you worry about a lot of things. You just stress out and the anxiety becomes so real because you're so worried about that. That's, that's one of the daily breads. That's when you say, give to God everything that I need. Lord, I need you to take care of this anxiety, this stress and the fear. How do you guys, don't raise your hand, but live in the fear of a past? Maybe something has happened or something will take place and you're afraid of what has happened in the past. And maybe sometimes we're thinking about what's going to take place in the future and I'm not prepared for that. I'm afraid of what could take place. All those anxieties, all those fears, all those worries that we try to live our life in just so overwhelms us. And what we do is we have no confidence in God in the present. And he wants to provide for us today. He wants us to get on our knees before God and say, Lord, today, I want to give it to you. I want to give my life, my fears, my anxieties, my stress, and I want to give it to you. And then I want to leave it with you. Because if I cannot leave it with you, all I'm doing is saying a prayer, and I'm taking up my own will instead of thy will. So the second thing is the principle for God's provision. The principle for God's provision. You know, we said last week that the Lord's Prayer is given to believers. You have to be a child of God before you could even understand the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which is talking about Abba Father, Dad, which is talking about those who have their faith in Jesus Christ, they're a part of the church family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And we're talking about we understand who God is and what God has done for us. And what he wants to do with provision is he wants us to be obedient to God's will. God's will is a big deal. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our day. What we have to do is we have to understand we have to be obedient to what God truly has for us. So I listed a few things that I thought would be good for us. Our first is our fellowship with Christ. Our fellowship with Christ. When we abide in Christ, there should be nothing more important to us than our relationship with Jesus, relationship with God. When we have that perspective correct, then I believe it's easy to live our life pleasing to God. In John 15, 7, it says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. 
When we understand what God wants, we can understand that we can ask and God will deliver. But when we ask for things that are outside of God's will, we're not abiding, put together, molded with Christ. We are opposed to the things of God. But when we say, God, I know what you want. I know your will for my life. I can ask anything because I know this is what you want for me, and you will give it to me. But when we are not in Christ, when we are opposing the very things of Christ, we cannot ask things of God that is against God's will. So if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Obedience, God's will. And then I believe a relationship with the church is very important. Relationship with true believers. When we're talking about our bread, we're talking about what God has done for us. Just taking Ashley and Neil when they part of the church and there's a problem that goes on within their life. Where do they go? We have to go to the family. We have to go to the family that can pray. We have to go to family that, that knows that they're going to get a hold of God and pray for them and encourage them. It is what a church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be somebody that can pray with and encourage one another. And in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, it says, And let you consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see when the day approaches. Exhorting. When somebody's down, when somebody struggles, the church, those that love God, our job is to encourage, is to love. What happens when um, we're talking about the church and we leave the church house Sunday afternoon, 12 o'clock, we go out to a restaurant and you come across a family member or a, a, a friend of yours that uh, maybe doesn't believe like you do. There may be an atheist. Maybe they're an agnostic. And you come in, you're all dressed up and you go to Applebee's and you get a two for 20 and, and you bow your head and you pray before you eat. And somebody's across the table over there and they're shaking their head and they say, well, you know, I really don't. I don't see why you do that. I don't believe in your God. I don't believe in God. You're a church family. You're a follower of Christ. What is your job? Is our job at that time to defend Christ? Is our job at that time to tell them what the Bible says and how sinful they are and that if they die they're going to go to hell or is our job is to show them what Christianity is all about our job at that time is to love them encourage them to use our name of our faith to enrich the glory of God our job is not to defend our position every time somebody opposes us more importantly they will listen more to our action than they will with our words. Our job is to love them, encourage them, and say, that's okay. I know where my provider lives, and I know what I'm going through, and I know what he has done, and I can trust him, and I can thank him. There's no need to defend. All we have to do is show. Show what true love is all about, and that is a relationship. That's what our church is all about. That's what we need to do. And then diligent in work habits. When we're talking about obedience, we need to be diligent in our work habits. Um, when we're talking about our work, how we make our money, how we make a living, um, I, the Bible is very clear that uh, it, it says that we should work. But we should work for, for some reasons. The first reason is we need to provide well for our family. And then we need to give back to God so God can do great things with our resources. And when we work diligently for God's work, when we stand before God, here's what the deal is. God doesn't really care how big your bank account is. What God really cares about is how much you've invested to bring glory to his name. How many souls that you've invested in to point people to Christ. When we look at, we think about, well, our society today is I'm going to give so I can get. I'm going to give so I can get. I'm going to give more so I can get more. I'm going to give so I can get. And that's a philosophy of our culture that is truly not a biblical concept of giving. We do not give to get more money. 
If we could ever understand this, Lord, give to me your will. Let me understand your way. Let me invest in your work. There's a song that's, uh, that's sung. It's, it's like 20 years old. It's called Thank You. And it's talking about a man that used to teach a Sunday school class, and he passes away, and he stands before God, and, and all of the people that he has influenced, one by one, stand beside him and walks right beside him. And as far as the eyes could see, people that he influenced walk beside him. And I believe that whole concept is exactly the concept when we talk about giving. It's not about the money that you give in the offering plate. It's about the heart that you give the money with. I want to change people's lives. If the Bible even said, don't give your resources grudgingly. If, if, if you don't want to do what God wants you to do, keep your money. God doesn't need your money. What God wants, he wants your heart. And if he has your heart, what he's going to do, he's going to reproduce and bless you because of the condition of the heart. Because the reason of our work is to provide for our family and to take care of God's work and to reach people for the cause of Christ. Our work is... What we do, we have to make money. But if we focus more on what we do than why we do it, then what we're doing is we're so involved with ourself, we're not talking about God's will will be done. So it is very important to understand why you work and what you do it for. You have to take care of your family. You have to take care of your future. But the bigger picture of our resources, are we doing what God wants us to do to reach a world for the cause of Christ. If we did not believe in the Great Commission, if we did not believe that the Word of God has told us and has mandated that the church is to reach a lost and dying world, keep your money. But when we believe that the church's job is to go into every house, go into every state, go into every country, every tongue, and every tribe, and every kin, that if we could go into that place, what it takes, it takes a volume of a city to reach a community, to reach resources. And it may not be a lot of your money, but it is your heart. That if every believer, every believer would have a passion and a love of a generous spirit, that what we could do is take what God has given to us and understand, I want to take care of my family. But I want to honor God more than I want to take care of all my necessities, all the things that I want. God's going to give to them to me. God's going to take care of what I need, what he wants. He wants our heart so we can change the world for the cause of Christ. And then we need to have an obedience in giving. Obedience in giving. Those who do not break the bond of greed set themselves up to be pierced through many troubles. A bond of greed. What we have to do is, to be honest with you, it's not yours. We have to understand everything that we have, everything that we do, every ability that we have, God has gifted us in that. Everything that we partake of, it's God's. And what we can do is we can just say, thank you, Lord, for what you have done for us. But those who do not break the bondage of greed themselves will be pierced through many troubles. We have to have a giving spirit, a giving spirit of our time of helping individuals out. And then, the perfection of God's provision. What is the perfection of God's provision? Well, when we're talking about give to us our daily bread, the perfection is, ultimately, Jesus is the bread of life. We could talk about everything that God wants us to do, but ultimately what we have to have, when we close our eyes and we take our last breath, we have to know that our Lord, Jesus Christ, died on the cross for my sins. If we do not have the faith of Jesus, everything that we have done within our life is void if we do not have that relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 6, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, for he will live forever. And he that bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of of this world. He is the living bread. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. What I have to do is I have to give to you an opportunity to see Christ. In order to, for God to look at this prayer, give us this day our daily bread. He 
has to be the motivator within your life. He has to be the person that you seek, the reason you change, the motivation of change. When you have an issue within your life, where do you go? You have a problem within your life, where do you go? You could say you could go to counselors, and that would be okay. You could say you go to your family, and that would be okay. You could say you go to a priest, and that would be okay. You could say you can come to a pastor, and that would be okay. The place you have to go is you have to go to the foot of the cross. And you have to see that Jesus Christ forgave you of every sin that you've ever committed. You have to trust that he is the very sustenance of your life. We do not live our life for self. We live our life for him. And if we as a church and we as the body of Christ, if we understand that my life is wrapped up in God's provision, I don't have to worry about all the stuff of life. I can trust in God for every day of my life. See, I've gone through a lot of calamities with many of you within the church. I've stood with many of you during funerals, hospital rooms. I've been with many of you during weddings and marriage counseling, which is almost as hard as the other one, but um, all kinds of different circumstances. And the one thing that I can only pray for you is I can ask God to bless you. And I can ask God to heal you. And I can ask God to give you a future of health and happiness within your life. But ultimately, the only thing that I can do is start the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. What's the next word? Thy will be done. When we look at somebody face to face and they're looking at Bruce Thomas praying for them or God's will be done for them, I bet 99.9% .9 of the people would rather have God than Bruce. I know I would. What I can do is, Lord, I want my will to be done. I want you to heal. I want you to bless. I want you to take care of. But Lord, I want your passion. All knowing. All conquering. Omnipresent. Power. Upon someone's life. Because when it says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's God. And then he just says this. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our provisions, our necessities, our life. We cannot move into the future. We cannot live because of the past. What we must do is we have to ask God to take care of me today. So many of you, as I have talked to many times, are struggling. You're struggling with things that you've never given to God. Or you're struggling with things that you've given to God and you picked up. You got fears of the past and you got fears of the future. You have anxieties and you have sin. And he says, give to us this day our daily bread. And what he wants to do is the man of principle. He wants to give to you today something that you can't give to yourself. You can't give to yourself hope. You can't give to yourself motivation. You can't give to yourself forgiveness. The only thing that you can do is say, Lord, I need you. After seeing who God is, after understanding how to worship God, he just says, 
our daily bread. My life. I want to give it to you. I need you to trust in me for everything. Many of us have done that. Many of us are struggling with that. Maybe you said in church week after week and year after year, and you say within your heart, that's a good concept. I understand the Christian thing. I understand what the Bible says about a lot of different things, but I really don't know if I want to give to him my life. I don't know if I'm ready to give up. I don't know if I'm ready to stay on the sideline, to put God where he needs to be. And I would tell you, it is probably the hardest thing that you will ever do is to put your confidence and your hope in God because he's asking you, get off the driver's seat. Put me in charge. I will bless you. I will forgive you. I will help you. But I don't need your help. I need your submission. And when you give me your submission, and I can take your life, and I can forgive, and I can help you, I can, if you abide in me, I can do the things that you ask me to do, but I can't do it unless you give to me an opportunity. And the Bible calls that the Holy Spirit's power. If you are convicted, if you're sitting in your seat today and you're thinking, I fought that fight many times. I have fought that addiction. I've struggled with that same sin, that same fear, that same anxiety, over and over and over and over. He's saying today, give us this day our daily bread. If you're struggling with it, give God your life so he can give you deliverance. The bread that he's talking about is the very thing of life. It's your very provision. We struggle so often with giving God our life, our issues. He wants it. He wants you to trust in him. It's the very first thing in the Lord's Prayer that Jesus is saying, let God do what he does. If you let God do what he does, he'll take care of you every step of the way. I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads. I'm going to ask Justin to make it up his way up to the platform. And what we're going to do is have a word of prayer. And um, We're not going to open the altars. But what we want to do is we want you to pray in your seats. And if you want me to pray for you during this invitation, I just want you to look at me. I want you to acknowledge to me that you want my prayer. And I can pray that God's will will be done within your life. You're struggling in certain areas. And if you're struggling in certain areas, the only way that we're going to change the action of our future is to change the present. Putting God where he needs to be. So I want to have a word of prayer with you. And then I'd like to have you, just in your chairs, offer that prayer unto God. And then if you would like for me to pray with you, if you would, just look at me and maybe raise your hand. And let me see your hand so I can, as your pastor, ask God's blessing upon your life and God's will that will be done. So let's all pray right now. Dear Father, we come before you and we ask you to honor us. Lord, give us what you want us to have. And that's a peace from our past and hope for our future and confidence today that you love us and that you're going to take care of us that you're going to be beside us Lord we need you we're people in most misery of pain and we need your forgiveness we need your reconciliation Lord we need your presence we love you for that in Jesus name as Justin is praying this, playing this song, and I ask you to, to pray. If you have a need that you're struggling with, and you would want myself and the staff to pray with you about, would you just raise your hand real quick? And I'll just start right over here. Just raise your hand. 
And if you're struggling with something and you want somebody to pray with you about, just raise your hand. See, there's nothing wrong with admitting that I need God. There's nothing wrong with that. The greatest place in the earth that you can go is on your knees asking the sovereign God of the world to baptize you in his presence and in his peace and give to you peace that's indescribable. It's the presence of God of saying, Dad, I need you. He lifts his child up. He wraps his arms around you. And he said, I thought you would never ask. Takes care of you. Puts you down. Sometimes he slaps you on the bottom. Sometimes he disciplines you. Sometimes he loves you. But you know God, Dad, is watching, loving, caring for you every second of the day. So when you raised your hand, you asked me to pray for you. You're asking God to bless you. I can't do that. But I can talk to God for you and with you. And God sees the heart. Open that heart and let God work. Abide in him and he will take care of every need that you have. Dear Father,